I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, that we have worked on Tanarong, Rundri, Gunai Kurnai and Boonarong, um, Boonarong country. And I'd like to acknowledge Uncle Larry Walsh, who has actually informed a lot of my my views and opinions on how I see forests. So, and thank you for sharing your stories today. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge you as well. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about what are the future, uh, what are the what's the present state of the mountain ash forest, and what what has kind of led to the present state, so the legacy, and then uh, what. What are, what are some possible futures? So I'm gonna go through uh, relatively quickly because I know this is a, this is a, a very in-depth area, but we, um, I'm going to go through it rather rapidly. But if we look at Matt Nash, it occupies the areas in red. So of the Matt forest area in Australia, we're only talking about 0.2% of forest area. So we're talking a very small area of the Australian uh, forested landscape. And as you're most aware, Mount Nash are defined by their iconic tall trees, but not just their tall trees, but their understory, the midstory, and so forth. And more importantly, these type of forests, so this is a tree on Gunai Kurnai country on the south face of Mount Borbor, um, these big old large trees are becoming rarer and rarer and rarer uh, due to factors that I'm going to allude into. And then we've got associated uh, ecosystems like the Alpine ash. Um, and there are other closely related uh, forest ecosystems that have also uh, been in, uh, that have been impacted over recent decades, um, and they all call they all sort of fall under a more generic um, uh, wet, wet and damp forest uh, ecological vegetation class. Now, a lot of these forests, and in the Central Highlands, have mapped about 24% of the mountain ash forest has been impacted by clear fell logging. And as you're most well, well aware, this involves the removal of all merchantable logs, the remaining logging debris is burnt under a high severity fire, and then a new crop of trees is planted on an ash bed. The legacies of this can be long lasting. On the uh, right hand side there, there is um, unlogged forest, but on the right, uh, left hand side, uh, that forest was logged uh, 54 years ago. So the legacies of the logging can be seen decades and decades after the uh, occurrence of them. Then we've got fire. So um, uh, 2009 was a particularly uh, tragic year and because uh, of the fires and uh, a substantial proportion of the mountain ash forest was also impacted uh, across. And that's an example of an unlogged forest there and that's a previously logged forest that was burnt in the Black Saturday fires. So if we look at the extent of disturbance across the landscape is not just the extent of disturbance, but it's also the proximity of, uh, of forest to disturbed areas that is also of concern here. So what uh, David and, um, and um, colleagues and, and myself have done, have, have done a disturbance mapping exercise where we've looked at the central highlands. Um, that's the extent of mountain ash forest. You can see it in relation to Melbourne. So in the year 2000, uh, that's how much forest was disturbed. So severely disturbed areas are in red and yellow is 200 metres from disturbed areas. So as time goes on, we go to 2005, we can see the 2009 fires getting in there. This is high severity disturbance. And we see it generally increase to 2020 where we only see a very small proportion of the forest area. Uh, you know, that is more than let's say a kilometre or so and greater than from a severely disturbed site. So when we look at that as a bar chart, we can see the impacts of logging in the first 10 years, and then you can see the jump of the fires and you can see the continued impact of uh, logging thereafter. So what we mapped is about up nearly 70% of the mountain ash forest is either severely disturbed or, or is within 200 metres of a severely disturbed area. So this has impacts, measured impacts on biodiversity. This is a draft set of charts. I've got, to up, um, I've got to update this slide, but you can see the updated slide in our published paper. But what we can see is that for lead bed as possum, greater glider, let, um, and sugar glider, we can see varying impacts. So the proximity to fire for, um, for lead bed as possum is that the closer to a disturbed area you are, 
that um, the, the, the less likely you're, you're able to find those species. However, there was an increase in sugar glider where there was, um, a, like, that, that is potentially a species that could be taking advantage of more disturbance in the landscape. So if we go back in time and we look at what was the landscape like pre-colonisation, um, pre um, you know, there's been talk about that the forest was open and grassy, and sure enough, there were examples of that. Aboriginal burning for thousands of years did create a mosaic of different landscape types, and this is a landscape that's south of Ballarat. You can paint it by Eugene von Gerard, and you can see it's quite open and grassy. So uh, a lot of these, um, a lot of inferences were made on the actual forest, the wet forest, the mountain ash forests. So Howitt, for instance, in, in a, in a um, symposium that he delivered here in 1890, uh, came to the assumption that, um, that the great forests of South Gippsland were open and grassy, and they were a legacy of traditional, burn, uh, traditional Aboriginal burning. Now, in some cases that, that is true, but in other cases we'll see we, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't uniform across the entire landscape. Uh, that sort of idea was picked up by Justice Leonard Stretton in his, uh, um, in the, his report on the 1939 Bushfire Royal Commission. Um, so, uh, but Leonard Stretton failed to acknowledge the uh, contributions of the, uh, to the landscape of uh, First Nations people. But he basically said that colonisers or Europeans were bringing in a new fire regime and this was changing the whole dynamic of the forest. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, then, more recently, Bill Gamage quotes Howard in his biggest estate on earth and commenting on the Gippsland forest, uh, he came up with a conclusion that they were open and grassy. However, there are extensive records to show that not all these forests were open and grassy. In fact, a lot of these forest areas were very, uh, were very thick and quite dense. So if we look at the extent of the mountain ash forest across central Victoria, that's what's in the hashed lines, the dark blue areas are the wet, damp forest um, ecological vegetation classes here. So that's what it looks like today. Um, prior to colonisation, this is what the extent was. So you can see a lot has been cleared. So this notion that there were more trees, uh, there are more trees now, in, in particularly in South Gippsland, than there were in 1788, runs into some significant uh, problems, particularly when you look at the evidence. So if we start with um, some um, uh, you know, accounts from First Nations people, we're, talking, we're, we're looking at, you know, one of the things I've noticed when I've put the registered Aboriginal party boundaries over some of these um, EVCs, you can see a lot of the boundaries of the First Nations align with some of these forest ecosystems. And, and, and a number of elders have actually shared with me, and I don't want to um, impinge on their cultural authority, that's not my role here, but they've actually said that some areas were long unburnt and they acted as kind of natural boundaries. They actually contained animals when they went out to hunt, like kangaroos. So, you know, we're not talking about wildernesses, but we're talking about a strategic way of looking at the land uh, to obviously, you know, enable um, the, you know, them to thrive. So, so when we look at um, what's happened, when we look at, like, uh, this is from the Gunai Kurnai uh, Joint Management Report for Tarabolga National Park, they basically say that the, the mountain ash forest there is representative of what their ancestors saw. And so that's their, that's their words. And so when you go into the Tarabolga National Park, they're, 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 they're telling us that that is a representation of what their ancestors would have walked through prior to colonisation. So then we go into colonial observations. So this is another painting by Eugene von Gerard. This is of the Akron Valley and Nanadong, which is the Tanarong word for cathedral ranges. And you can see they're open and grassy areas, but to the mountains up onto the left, it's where the mountain ash and alpine ash are, you can see that it's quite thickly forested. So you're seeing, you're seeing you know, quite a diverse landscape just in this one uh, painting. So one of the things that I looked at were some explorer accounts. So two people that, or two expeditions, and I call them expeditions, they weren't exploring, they were scouting for pastoral land on, uh, uh, across uh, First Nations countries, but there was the expedition of Human Hovell and the expedition of Streslakey. So if we start with Human Hovell, what interested me is their path going to what is being called Mount Disappointment and then turning back and then going around the plateau. 
So when you go through the journals, they actually say things like that. Here we find ourselves completely uh, at a stand without a clue as to the direction we should go. They just could not see where to go. Uh, and at one spot they noticed that the trees, and I actually went into the Wallaby Creek catchment before the Black Saturday fires and you know, managed to see some of this magnificent mountain ash there. And they, they talk about these incredible trees, but they were also unable to get through it. And because they couldn't penetrate the forest, they called it Mount Disappointment. So, um, so the name in itself is a clear indication of what that forest was actually uh, potentially like. And this is back in 1824. So these are one of the first encounters, the first European encounters with the forest ecosystem. Then we go to the notes from Streslecki. And so um, uh, he, was, he was wanting to go from the Australian Alps down to Corner Inlet near Wilson's uh, Prom. But the forest was so thick that he turned and then uh, wanted to go to uh, um, uh, Western Port Bay, what is today called Coronella. And so um, they basically were continually up against the thickness and impenetrability of the forest. And in this particular case, the direct course led us through 22 days of almost complete starvation. So from Merbu North to Western Port Bay, it took them 22 days, and that's something that a person like me could probably walk in two or three. So that's an indication of just how difficult that terrain was. Then we go, there's a really good book called The Land of the Lyrebird. It, it, it re recollects um, early um, colonising um, experiences of the forest. And they talk about the three layers, that tall mountain ash forest, overstory, midstory, and understory. So if we look at some of the historic sites, uh, just these are some of the areas that were painted, like the Akron Valley, Fernshaw. Uh, this is a very famous painting by Eugene von Gerard, Ferntree Gully in the Dandenong Ranges. This is not mountain ash, but it is probably more in the damp forest ecological vegetation class, but you can see it, there's a very thick and very well established understory there. Uh, he also went to the Otway Ranges, and again, you can see a very thick and uh, dense forest. And it wasn't open that you could ride a horse through because there would be no reason for, for this horse track to be cut through. So, and then there's this beautiful painting by Isaac Whitehead in 1880, uh, uh, which is near, near Fernshaw. Sorry, there's my spelling mistake there. Uh, then we go into some scientific observations, and one of the things I want to point out is that the Leadbedder's possum actually requires a landscape of old hollow-bearing trees mixed with a very thick con uh, connecting understory to protect it from predation. And so when we look at um, a map like this, the Leadbedder's possum was first uh, scientifically cate categorised or documented by McKay in 1867 at the Bass River. And in fact, William Hovell tried to walk up to the source of the Bass River, only got up a few miles, but was forced to turn back because of the impenetrability of the, of the forest back in 1826, I think it was. Anyway, um, and so another sample, was, another um, lead beater's possum was observed at Kui Rup, so, or near Kui Rup. And this is from a paper that da a, a very younger version of um, my colleague David did in 1991 modelling the uh, historic extent based on historic observations. So, so we're seeing a, a landscape um, you know, where it was most likely that there was actually very uh, thick um, and uh, you know, a, a dense forest cover. So if we go into the history of it, like particularly in South Gippsland, there was extensive clearing. And so this was taken probably a little over 100 years ago near Currumburra. So if you'd ever drive through the green hills of Currumburra, there was once a, a majestic forest there, and it's now uh, cow paddocks. But they effectively ring-barked the trees. And so these are just some explorer accounts. And they talked about how they were introducing fire, so they would ring bark the trees, try to set fire. In the early stages of clearing, the fires couldn't take off, but as more and more people came in and cleared the forest, reduced that kind of moist, wet forest, and this is some of the things that you were talking about, Uncle Larry, um, that actually primed the forest to give us Red, Red Tuesday, the 1898 fires. So today, all we see of this forest is a plaque on the Lock One Thaggy Road. Let this, remind, let this memorial remind us of the sacrifices made by pioneer men and women who cleared the great forest on these hills. So now we get into the fire bit. Uh, 
Um, so they talk about where um, uh, Justice Leonard Stretton says that the 1939 fires were lit by the hand of man. And he talked about how these European fires changed the whole structure of the forest. Now, when the fires went through and it burnt 3.2 million odd hectares, uh, give or take, there was an extensive salvage logging uh, program that was instigated. And Minister, the Minister for Forests in 1939 said, we have a responsibility to salvage this timber. And so this had a dramatic impact on the forest. So a lot of forests that would have carried on into the next, a lot of, lot of the past biological legacies were removed. And if we look at the actual logging, it was actually policy in 1928. The majority of mountain stands are virgin forests. This is Mount Nash containing a large proportion of over or over mature timber demanding immediate felling. So that was policy, it was to get rid of these forests. And so applicate, the application of the clear fell burn and so method was widely applied across the forest estate. And, um, and so this has left us a very different forest to the one that let's say, uh, you know, the, you know, that the First Nations people were seeing, that the uh, human hovel and Streslakey were seeing we're looking at a landscape domi dominated by young trees. And within that, like this is a, a, a past clear fell logging coop, probably 15, uh, 10 to 15 years uh, after logging, we're seeing it, um, you know, there's there are a lot of weeds incurring into those forest stands. There are also, and David showed a slide of this, uh, there are extensive areas of failed regeneration. And, um, and also, this is what the Streslechis, what you know, the forest of uh, South Gippsland, look, a lot of it looks like today, cow paddocks with, ero with erosion. What are some of the, what's the future? Well, if we look at it, you've seen these slides before. We did a study where we looked at, these were the fires and the number of fires that have burnt in the period from 1980 to 2000. And this is after 2000 to 2020. So we're seeing areas burning up to three to four times within only a, uh, a 20 year period. So one of the things that we actually have to look at is self-determination of First Nations people is absolutely paramount. Um, we actually, we as, you know, in the academic and scientific community need to form meaningful and respectful partnerships with First Nations people so we can complement them and, and support them in achieving self-determination. Um, this also has to be coupled in with like identifying priority areas, so this is a paper that David and I did, where we identified areas outside the formal reserve system that would need to be prioritised for, for a strategy towards a protected area network. Now, there are all these different um, ways of protecting. Uh, the IUCN has six protection categories from categories one to, uh, one to six, and there are a lot of Indigenous protected areas that uh, rec um, that. Uh, incorporate those uh, IUCN protected areas. So the, um, the Convention on Biodiversity incorporates the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People into its framework. And so we've got international sort of frameworks to use as a guide here to respectfully and actually, um, uh, you know, to adequately, you know, protect the suite of values. And also looking at areas that are relatively intact. So some of these areas that I've circled here, like, a landscape like that off the view of the top of Mount Borbor is a rare thing today. You don't stand up on a place like that and actually look at an unbroken canopy of Mount Nash Forest. So these are kind of like the arcs that are carrying species into the future and these must be prioritised and we need to protect them from incurring bushfires like they did with the Wallamai Pine in, in the Gospers Mountain Fire. Uh, we actually need to place a lot of value on these remaining areas. So as the landscape recovers, we can, um, we can sort of rehabilitate. And I'm on 20 minutes right there. <laughs>